Most of us watching this video will have seen The Matrix, or one of the sequels. Those that haven't seen it, well, why haven't you? It's a great film. Even if you haven't seen it though, you probably know what it's about. The characters in the film exist in two worlds. The real world of flesh and bone, and the machine world of the digital. This is the construct. It's our loading program. The people in the machine world were all part of a powerful supercomputer, with their bodies in the real world being plugged into the machine. All of their experiences in the machine world are fake, and fed to them through the supercomputer. Well, not exactly the same as No6 Experience Machine, it definitely borrows very heavily from it. And well, there will no doubt be references to The Matrix as this video goes along, this video is not about The Matrix and its similarities to No6 Experience Machine. It's just going to be about the experience machine thought experiment and Nozick's argument. We'll begin by taking a look at value hedonism and the thought experiment itself, and then look at Nozick's argument along with some of the responses to it, including some informal research done in experimental philosophy that shows that there may be more to people's responses than Nozick argued. And of course, wrap it all up with a few thoughts. So, what is Nozick's experience machine thought experiment? In order to understand Nozick's thought experiment, we first need to understand a little bit about value or philosophical hedonism. The reason for this is that it is this idea that the thought experiment is attacking. Hedonism, in this case, is referring to the doctrine or idea that pleasure is the good. Meaning that pleasure is the only thing of value, and the thing that ought to be sought out. Pleasure is the thing that is intrinsically valuable, or valuable for its own sake or end. It is the final value. All other things that we value have instrumental value. Meaning that all the other things that we value are simply means to get us closer to the end, the final value of pleasure. Those familiar with something like utilitarianism will be familiar with this idea. Utilitarianism is a form of hedonism, where maximizing the amount of pleasure is the good. However, Nozick's thought experiment focuses on the idea that pleasure is the only thing that has final value, or the only end. This should be kept in mind when looking at his thought experiment. In his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia, Robert Nozick asks us to imagine a machine that could give us any and every experience we could ever dream of and desire. Not physically, of course, but digitally, sort of. You would be put into suspended animation inside a tank and have your brain connected to the supercomputer that is this machine. This would give the experience machine the ability to control your consciousness in much the way that Descartes' evil demon is feeding you experiences, or the mad scientist of the brain in a vat experiment. You would be living these experiences, not just simulating them. They would be simulated, but to you they would be very real. All of the pleasure you would experience inside of this machine would be of the exact same intensity and length as if you had experienced it in the real world. What experience would you like? Reaching the top of Mount Everest? Easy. Publish the most successful and influential novel ever written? Well, that can be done too. Do you want to marry the one that got away? All that joy and elation and happiness and pleasure you ever dreamed of is there for you. You get to pick everything you ever desired and completely write your life. How was he? Ten hours straight. He's a machine.
I know Kung Fu. Of course, if you're worried about trying to write your entire life in one go, then allowances can be made. The scientists can pull you out every couple of years and give you time to plan your next couple of years. You will even forget you were pulled out once you're put back in. There will not be a break in the experience inside the machine itself. So while there may be some loss of pleasure, it's soon forgotten and ultimate bliss can begin again. The question that Nozick asks here is, would you plug into the machine? Nozick argues that if all that matters is how our lives feel from the inside, then we should not care where these experiences come from. If all that matters is the experience and the pleasure that we get from it, then there should be no hesitation with regard to plugging in. So would you plug in? If you wouldn't, then why wouldn't you? One reason you wouldn't plug in, Nozick argues, is that when we dream of some achievement, it is not just the experience we are thinking of. What we dream of is the achievement and the partaking of the activity and the doing the work. There is an element of the experience that we dream about, of course, and we dream of the emotions and the pleasure. There are probably also things we dream of where we dream only of the experience and pleasure. However, what matters to the argument is that there are some things we dream of achieving that aren't concerned solely with the experience and the pleasure, but that we want to do them. The second reason we might not plug in, he argues, is that we want to be a certain kind of person. We don't just want to feel like we're a famous writer, we dream of being the famous writer. Or the person who dreams of performing on Broadway does not dream of feeling like it, they dream of the performing aspect of it. We also see ourselves as courageous, or caring, or hardworking. And can someone in the machine be said to be any of these? The experiences are not real, and there are no real threats. Everything is fine-tuned to maximize pleasure. So, plugging into the machine means we could never be the kind of person we want to be. Ultimately, nothing of the experience really matters. Finally, living our lives in the machine means that we are limited to a man-made reality. We would be in a world where there is no real meaning. There is nothing more important about that world than the pleasures that can be constructed inside it. No deeper reality or deeper meaning. Something that many of us value over and above simply feeling pleasure. People refusing to plug into the machine and refusing for reasons such as this are evidence that value or philosophical hedonism are false. Pleasure is not the only final value and the only end. There is something over and above that, our connection to reality and how we desire to live. As stated by Baber in The Experience Machine Deconstructed, Nozick's argument is an ambitious piece of conceptual analysis. Baber goes on to tell us that Nozick's argument isn't just about establishing that most people would choose to live in reality over a fantasy, nor is it merely to determine what matters or has value to people. The purpose of the experiment is to get informed and rationally considered responses under epistemically favorable conditions. With the assumption being that given these conditions, those being asked will know what states matter to them and will get their answer right. Baber rephrases the argument as such. If a reasonable and informed subject I would choose S over S alternate, then S would contribute more to I's well-being than S alternate. If we look to Alex Barber's 2011 paper Hedonism and the Experience Machine, we see the argument fleshed out slightly fuller in the form of a syllogism. Barber's syllogism goes as such. Premise 1. You and other readers would not plug into the experience machine. Premise 2. A genuine hedonist would plug into the experience machine. Conclusion 1. Neither you nor other readers are genuine hedonists. Premise 3. If neither you nor other readers are genuine hedonists, hedonism is mistaken. Conclusion 2. Hedonism is mistaken. So, as can be seen, the argument is one that attacks the truth of value or philosophical hedonism. 
The thought experiment is aimed at bringing about an informed response regarding the value of pleasure over a connection to reality. As most people would respond that they would prefer the connection to reality, then this shows that we do not value pleasure as the only final value. Therefore, this shows that hedonism is false or mistaken. Of course, there is one matter to resolve here. The claim that you or others would not plug in. It seems very bold to assume that either you or I would not plug into the machine. After all, we may very well be hedonists and plug into the machine. I've met plenty of people that answer that they would plug into the machine. It seems even more bold to make a claim like most people would not plug into it, especially from an armchair, which is a criticism raised by Belshaw, who argues that the we and the wouldn't in the final sentence of Nozick's argument is a a bit fuzzy and ambiguous. Arguing that Nozick can't mean that nobody would jump at the chance, there will always be at least one person that will accept any offer. As stated, I know plenty of people who responded positively to jumping into the machine. Belshaw argues that instead Nozick means something like no thinking reflective person would accept this offer. However, Belshaw thinks that this is also wrong, as is Nozick's claim that rejecting entering the machine might teach them or us something about what is important to them. Another criticism that Belshaw makes of Nozick's claim about how many would reject entering the machine is that it is done without any data. No survey data is provided, neither for how many people do reject the offer or their reasons for rejecting the offer. After all, it could be the case that the reasons that they reject entering the machine, Belshaw argues, might not be incompatible with them actually plugging into the machine. We'll come back to Belshaw's other criticisms later, but for now let's look at the criticism about the lack of survey data through the work of Philippe de Brigard in his 2010 paper, If You Like It, Doesn't Matter If It's Real. De Brigard discusses performing an informal survey in an introductory philosophy class, stating that the majority of his students chose not to plug into the experience machine. However, upon further probing of their reasons for not plugging in, De Brigard found that most of them, 60% to be precise, gave reasons that had nothing to do with their preference for a real life over a virtual one. Instead, De Brigard states, the students gave reasons such as not believing the machine could predict what they need or that they would be unhappy going it alone without friends and family and the lack of surprising experiences. In order to further test the claims, he performed more experiments and surveys. This time putting the emphasis on removing ourselves from the machine and returning to reality. Three different vignettes were created to be presented to people. One neutral, one positive, and one negative. They were then put to students with no philosophical training at the University of North Carolina. On screen now is the neutral vignette. As can be seen, it's quite lengthy. Pause it if you want to have a read of it. Essentially though, it is a reverse experience machine. Rather than asking whether you will plug in, you are asked whether you would disconnect. In this instance, you are already inside the machine. You are surprised by a knock at the door from a man claiming your entire existence is fake. What you are experiencing is not reality, but instead the result of being plugged into an experience machine designed to give you pleasurable experiences. You are then asked whether you would like to remain plugged in, carrying on with your life unknown that it is not real, or would you like to unplug and return to reality? You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. The students were asked to expand on their reasoning, of course, and you are free to hear as well if you want. Just drop your thoughts or your responses in the comment section and I'd love to discuss it with you. As I mentioned though, there was also a positive and negative version. These can be seen on screen right about now. Pause if you want to have a read of them. 
Looking at the both of these, we can see why each one carries the moniker it does. The neutral version makes no claim of what your life will be like upon return. Well, the negative vignette does give a description and describes a life of negative experience, with the positive version giving a description of returning to a very positive and pleasurable life. The results showed that when the prospect of returning to reality was one that was not favorable, many people decided to remain in the fantasy, where the positive was split down the middle and the neutral slightly biased towards returning to reality. This seems to imply that what we believe about the reality we are returning to can have an impact on whether we return. A second neutral vignette was then offered up, the one on screen now. This version of the neutral vignette includes information about the reality that will be returned to. It does not say anything at all about the positive or negative nature of the reality, just that it is not at all like the one that we have experienced. This had something of an impact on the choices, as can be seen here. The bias clearly and sharply shifts from one side to the other. De Brigard argues here that status quo bias plays a part in the responses. So, what is status quo bias? The status quo bias describes the fact that people generally prefer the state of affairs as they are and that they are currently in, especially when faced with a choice where the disadvantage of leaving it be is larger than the advantages. The status quo bias is a form of loss aversion bias, a class of various biases. It distorts our choices and judgments at the point of reference by making it asymmetrical. Put it in slightly simpler language, the status Status quo bias is a cognitive bias where we consider our current existence and situation and experiences as the baseline. Then when looking at other options, we assess them starting from and according to that baseline. We assess the positive and the negative according to where we are, or the status quo. Then from those positives and negatives, we determine whether to adopt, adapt, or remain where we are. With this bias meaning that our judgments are not symmetrical in their assessments. So, while the Brigard doesn't give us exactly what Belshaw was asking for with regards to survey data, it does give us something interesting to think about. The information might not hold up as a generality, as the sample size is so small. The survey was also informal, and so we shouldn't jump to any conclusions of our own. However, it does seem to suggest that Nozick may have jumped to some conclusions of his own. When looking at the Brigard's paper, we see him admitting that most of the students agreed that they would not plug in. This seems to match with Nozick's claim that most people would choose not to plug in. However, the picture changed after the students' reasons were probed a little bit further. As mentioned earlier, many of the reasons given were not linked to a desire to remain attached to reality. So it seems that Nozick's move from the rejection to the reasons for the rejection are more of a leap than the empirical evidence would seem to suggest here, which is the criticism that I pointed Belshaw out as making earlier that Nozick made his claim without any data. We'll look at another objection from Belshaw in a moment, but let's just conclude here first. What the Brigard shows us is that many people do refuse initially to plug into the machine. However, when their reasons for refusing to plug into the machine are probed, they appear to be very different to the reasons that Nozick proposes. In many cases, it was reasons to do with mistrusting the machine, not being able to bring family members in, and others. It may even simply be a psychological bias that keeps us from plugging in, giving us good reason to think that Nozick's conclusion lays on much shakier ground when the intuitions of people are actually probed and their reasons for refusing are brought to the fore. It also showed us that how the question is asked can make a difference to the choice, as does the amount and kind of information of the life being returned to can make a difference to whether or not someone might decide to plug in or plug out. 
Other criticisms that Belshaw brings against the experience machine relate to different claims made by Nozick. One related to the value of reality and one related to the value of the experiences in the machine. Recalling from earlier, Nozick's argument consists of several reasons why we wouldn't plug in. One of them is that the experiences in the machine would have no deeper connection to reality and no real value to them. However, as Belshaw argues, there seems to be a certain contextual element to these claims. Belshaw gives us various examples like a life that consists in constant pain, or the ability for someone in a wheelchair being able to live their dream of climbing Mount Everest. It is easy to think of many examples that fit this bill. We can imagine children being experimented on in terrible ways by cruel scientists in some dystopian future. Would a life of torture and experimentation be more valuable than a life of pleasure in the machine? Would the life of torture and experimentation be the one that the children ought to prefer simply because of the intrinsic value of reality? Think of an example like this. Imagine that we have a prisoner in some future dystopia. For some reasons unknown to us, and probably not worth trying to imagine why, prison guards have the prisoner tied to a chair. The prisoner is also attached to something like the experience machine. However, inside the experience machine, the prisoner is having an almost identical experience. They are tied to a chair, in a room in a prison, with two guards in front of them. Each time a guard in the real world inflicts some pain on him, the experience machine then translates that into what the prisoner is experiencing. The torture method is different and the guard is different, but the torture the prisoner is getting in their consciousness is of equal measure, both psychologically and physically. Can it really be said here that the torture in the real world is more valuable than the torture in the experience machine simply by virtue of its connection to the real world. Belshaw gives us a similar example through Bill and Ben, two prisoners. Bill is in the real world, in a real prison, suffering real torture. Bill's pain is connected to the real world and real events. When we say the phrase, Bill is in pain because of the torture, that phrase is true. Ben, however, is hooked up to an experience machine, having the experience of being tortured in prison. In the real world, he's lying on a comfortable bed with nurses monitoring his vital signs and nothing else physically happening to him. So to say Ben is in pain because of the torture is false because Ben isn't really being tortured. He's actually just being fed the experience by a machine. However, Ben is still feeling the pain in his consciousness. If we were to take all things being equal with regards to the pain levels between the two, both are still consciously experiencing the same feelings. Is Bill having the better and more valuable experience here? Does Bill's connection to reality make the torture better than Ben's because Ben isn't actually being tortured? Does the idea that Ben's torture is not real make his pain go away or feel any less painful? Belshaw also offers us another example, this one a little less sadistic. In this example, we're given Carol and Alice. Carol is a teacher in an inner city school and also enjoys playing the ukulele. Alice lives an identical experience, only she does it in the experience machine. Carol's beliefs are mostly true and Alice's are mostly false. Both feel the same amount of pleasure, all things considered. Belshaw asks why it should matter that Carol's beliefs are mostly true and Alice's mostly false. In what way does that make Carol's life the better life? Of course, we could argue that Carol is bringing good to all the pupils she teaches, and we can accept that. There could even be ways to balance the amount of good done between Carol and Alice's experiences. What needs to be focused on here, though, is the idea that it is having the true beliefs that makes Carol's life the good life and Alice's not.
It seems that the idea of a life based in reality and has more value than a simulated life is a strong intuition, at least when good lives are being presented. It is much harder to dismiss the intuition in the case of Carol and Alice than it is in the case of Bill and Ben. The idea that a life full of pain in the real world is more valuable than a life full of pain in a simulated world is strongly counterintuitive. The idea that Bill's beliefs being mostly true and Ben's beliefs being mostly false, making Bill's life of torture more valuable also seems highly counterintuitive. Unlike what we say in the case of Carol and Alice, where the idea that all of Carol's beliefs being mostly true seems to have intuitive pull towards it being considered better. However, that imbalance between our intuitions in these cases seems to suggest that perhaps the connection to reality doesn't hold the value that Nozick seems to suggest it does. When we consider the imbalance presented here by Belshaw, we seem to have good reasons to reject Nozick's claim that a connection to reality is more valuable to us than the pleasure of the experience, or because it's attached to reality. There's far more going on than that. So yeah, that's it for this video on the experience machine from Robert Nozick. We began the video with a brief look at the thought experiment itself, as well as the argument that Nozick is making with the thought experiment, then took a look at some possible objections to the argument. Nozick's experience machine has been around since 1974 and has been an influential argument, at one time being promoted as a knockdown argument against value or philosophical hedonism meaning that we also just barely scratch the surface of the discussion and the ideas and the objections. As can be imagined, a work that has been around that long and been that influential means that there is a lot of discussion surrounding it, including lots of literature too. What was presented here was just a couple of examples. There's no conclusion in this video as far as an argument is concerned. I'll leave that to you, the viewer, to decide. Is Nozick's argument a knockdown argument? Does he make his case? Or do people like Baber, Barber, Belshaw, and de Brigard give us reason to reject the argument? Do you have your own reasons for not plugging in or rejecting Nozick's claims in conclusion? If you do, then feel free to leave me a comment down below. As always, references for this video are in the description. Take care all. See you soon. Bye.